Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Well, let's open up to the book of Acts, please. We are in chapter 11. Going through the book of Acts. It's been a while. It's always good to review what the early church did, what they went through, how the Holy Spirit worked through the church with the signs and wonders, etc. Uh, God has not kept, or rather God has not quit doing signs and wonders, but we in the Western world don't seem to see them as much. And so a lot of charlatans come up claiming things. And uh, it's all part of the plan of, uh, of Satan, of course, to disrupt the true church. But we're not going to fall for it. And uh, so to begin with, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. How you've given us a name under heaven by which all men must be saved. We read in Acts 4.12. By the words of Peter, who ought to know. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us enough to die on the cross for our sins and pay the price that holy justice demanded and we could never meet. Thank you for that, Lord. Forgive us our sins. Be with Pastor Eric and his family and congregation. All others who truly love you and preach your name and, and your word and the gospel. We pray for all those who are persecuted for that very th same thing. And should it befall us sometime in the near future, Lord, it's getting closer and closer, give us the strength to, to get through it, to still praise your name, and to still preach your word, knowing that this life is really nothing, that what we're waiting for is eternity with you. And you've graciously given us all the time, as it were, to make a choice for you, and to continue in that choice until it's our last breath. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Be with the remnant of Israel, all those who should join the church, and as well as the remnant of Gentiles. Lord, let the fullness of that number of Gentiles be complete, if it be possible today. For we wait for that wonderful rapture, that great hope that we're taught through the letters of the New Testament, Lord to be raptured out of here, to be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, you wouldn't believe how many people are teaching against the rapture and they claim, to be, <laughs> they claim to be Christians. They can't explain any of the scriptures, of which there are many, that speak about the rapture, and as well as all the others who have been raptured, they can't explain any of that, uh, but they sure make claims, which is really silly. Well, chapter 11... Uh, we read in chapter 10 how Peter was uh, summoned by Cornelius, a devout man. He was a Roman, belonged to the Roman legion. <coughs> Excuse me. And he, uh, but he believed in the God of Israel, and he believed a lot of other things that are vital to that, as we see as we read this chapter. And so uh, Peter and them, those guys coming back, uh, kind of get given the third degree here. And so Peter has to explain himself. And as part of ironing, sharpening iron, as part of wanting to know what's going on and a real explanation of why we do what we do. And so, and remember, it's, it's the church in the very, very, very beginning. And uh, uh, the Jews still had Jewish, a Jewish worldview as they were taught at home and in the various uh, uh, temple services they had and so forth. You know, Jesus went regularly to the temple, etc. And uh, they were taught about the law of Moses and such. Uh, not that the Pharisees lived it, but they, they taught it. And that's why Jesus told the disciples, do what they say in as much as they, they uh, you know, speak about Moses, but don't do what they do. Because they don't do what they say, so they're really liars. Uh, but as far as Moses' law is concerned, you're still going to have to keep it just like I am keeping it. Uh, Jesus lived under the law of Moses, of course, and then, then after his death on the cross and, and burial and resurrection is when everything else became new. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? I know I am. So verse 11, 1. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. They were, they were shocked. They were surprised. They didn't think it was possible. They thought God only dealt with, with the Jews. 
with Israel. Verse 2, And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. That is, they argued with him and they wanted to earnestly know, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. See, we don't get how serious this was. It's like if you grew up Jewish, uh, in those days especially, you don't hang out with the Gentiles at all. You cause a separation, which God never really caused. But because Israel lost the law, and then we read in Nehemiah how they got the law back, and it was reread to them, and they stood for like three days listening to it and repented, and uh, Nehemiah had them all give up their, their pagan wives and their children. This is a tough one. Either you love, and this is where God says you got to love me more than you love your, your kids and your spouse. That's a tough one for us, isn't it? But God being love and life, what else could we do? And what else makes sense? Really nothing. But that's how it was. And so the law was refound, as it were, uh, in this particular generation that Nehemiah was preaching to. And some harsh things had to be done. And that kind of the era when they really separate themselves so never again be polluted by the, by the pagans, by the Gentiles. And so it was an, it, it's similar to, to what the Dunkards and uh, you know, German Baptists try to do by wearing the 18th century clothing and the beard and all that. They're trying to make a distinction that we're not of the world. Okay, but what does the modern church do? And I'm not saying they're right or wrong, the dunkards or whatever, uh, clothing, things like that. They, they can't make you more holy and everything. Paul is clear about that. So they're not right in that way, but in the way that they try to separate themselves from the rest of the world, that is admirable. We all should be doing that. We just can't do it by clothing or haircut or whatever. Uh, and so... <clears throat> So we have this big distinction. And so these Jews here were telling Paul, Whoa, what did you do? I can't believe you did this. That's what this was. He was, he was hit head on with this right away. He, he, he's not back in town more than a, a, probably a few hours, uh, a day at most, and they come to do this. because They heard about this because word of mouth went pretty fast and they were astounded. They contended with him. Verse 4, but Peter explained it to them, now listen, in order from the beginning. He had a rhyme and a reason here, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts and uh, creeping things and birds of the air. And a voice of, uh, rather, I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. He, of course, was obeying Jewish law, and he said, No, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, where I, where I was having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. This is something that he innately knew. The Spirit of God was telling him, you've had it, I've had it. There are certain things that I was, I've been told in the past to do, and I did them. I felt like it was God. Everything was wonderful about it. There was no doubt. There was peace. And he says, Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us, verse 13, how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who had said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter who will tell you, this is important, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. This is the key. Here's a man who already believed in the true God of Israel, who is the only true God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here's a man who gave alms and such and, and helped build uh, synagogues and things and helped out the Jewish nation as well as whoever else needed help. That's just the kind of guy he was. And he had what it took, but he didn't have enough. 
So you can be a nice person. You can even believe that there's only one true God and you can even believe that it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it's not quite enough because this man was told he needs to know more. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Uh, go with me to Romans 2.14, please. To the right, go east. Romans where? Well, st no, st no, no, start out at, uh, at 20, 120. Are you there? Yes. Yes. Paul is explaining. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Listen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is no one that has an excuse. There is no one that can say, I don't believe in God and be telling the truth. There's no one that can say, uh, I think it was evolution, and tell the truth. There's no one who can say, I don't know how this all came about, and tell the truth. Because this says, everybody knows. Since creation of the world, his invisible are clearly seen, and being understood, they're not only seen, they're understood. You see, Cornelius saw and understood. Now, in this case, in, in uh, go to 21 of Romans, Paul is talking about the negative part of those who just deny. And he says, because although they, listen, although they, although they knew God, it's not like they don't know God. Every pagan in the world knows God. They just deny him. Paul right here says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile, where? In their thoughts. And where else? In their foolish hearts were darkened. Why are we supposed to put down every thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God? When some idiot comes along and says, oh, evolution is the way, and you know it's God, because this says you know. <laughs> you know, no, everybody knows. It's amazing that everybody knows. I've... Uh, Shared this with you before, some years ago, <coughs> I was uh, looking up some stuff and I came across a, a, a German guy who did a good job on the law of Moses. It's like a long, long 40, 50, 60 page deal. But he did a, did, he did a treatise on that and, so, and I liked a lot of it. In fact, I liked all of it. He did a good job. So I translated some of this. And the, mad, the fact here is, like, just like Cornelius, the law of nature or natural law is what Paul refers to in Romans 2.14. Go to 2.14. Are you there? One page over. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience... Also bearing witness. Remember, conscience is with knowledge. So this is the knowledge that they're, what knowledge are they with? The knowledge of the Lord, uh, back to 120, that they have no excuse, that they know, they understood. Everybody understands that God created things. There's no such thing as saying, well, I, don't, I believe it was a, a monkey who did it or whatever. It's ridiculous. Everybody knows it's God. So show the, the law written in the hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves or rather in between, yeah, themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So they either deny it or they affirm it. And so it's life or death for them in the decision. In 16, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Paul's speaking. So this commentary says the law of nature or the natural law is what Paul referred to in Romans 2.14. When the heathen that don't have the law do by nature what the law requires... Even though they have no written law, then they are a law unto themselves. The natural law contains natural revelations of God and his eternal power and something of the nature of God. We just read that in 120 of Romans. His self-sustaining causal power 
and is thus enough to damn those who reject this revelation. But it is not enough to bring actual eternal salvation. This is where Cornelius was. He believed it, so he wasn't damned, but he, so he was ready to receive the finality of this revelation for everlasting life. Go to 2 Peter 3, 5. I just want to park in this area for a little bit because it's very important. And keep your spot there in, in Romans as well. Because I want to... In, in Romans 1, 21, <coughs> look what Peter says. Are you there? For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world then that uh, existed perished being, flood with, or being flooded with water. So God created it, but they willfully forget this. It's willing ignorance. Go back to uh, 121. Because they, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God and nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Look at 22. What did they do? Profess to be wise. They became fools. This is the enlightenment. This is all those who have a PhD who claim they know better. All these so-called uh, Bible scholars in these colleges, you know, biblical colleges and Christian colleges that are teaching trash to our young people. They have this enlightenment mentality that they know more than what God already said. It's ridiculous. Now, those who reject the clear revelation from nature show thereby that they are not then in position to receive the light that naturally follows. If you reject that God made everything, you cannot get to the Savior. Cornelius did. He was ready. The, his door was wide open to the Savior because he already believed. He already gave. He already understood. He didn't deny it like these fools Paul's talking about. Go to Jeremiah 10. Go to Jeremiah 10. He was a good friend of mine. You guys are too young for that song. <laughs> This refers back to 2 Peter, or forward to 2 Peter 3, 5. Verse 14, Jeremiah 10, 14, look what he says. Everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Now this is willing ignorance. Every metal smith is put to shame by an image, for his molded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. If you don't have breath, you don't have life. Because you don't have spirit. Breath is spirit. The Ruach. Hallelujah. Those who reject the clear revelation from nature show thereby, by rejecting, that they are not then in position to receive the light that naturally follows. That is the special revelation revealed through the Holy Word of God that is necessary for salvation. This is why evolution is pushed like it is. Go with me to John 5, the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Johann. Verses 46, 47, we've used them a lot. For if you believed Moses, Jesus is speaking, you would believe me. Why? For he wrote about me. Verse 47. But if you do not believe his, Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? You cannot get past the, you know, uh, the Pentateuch, you cannot get first Genesis 1. If you don't believe Genesis 1, you cannot believe anything that follows. And you are dead in your sins forever. You can never receive the Savior because by your own willing ignorance, you're stopping it. These colleges and these supposedly Christian schools are teaching just that. 
They're teaching classes in biblical criticism. I get criticizing it so you can compare, but they're criticizing it just to put it down, just to put a doubt in these young people's minds that go there. And, and to say that, well, Genesis, well, they, it was written to people who didn't really get it. They, they, were, they were poor, dirt, you know, sod busters. They, they weren't scientifically minded like us. Go back to Acts. <coughs> or, um, I'm sorry, not Acts. Uh, uh, Romans 1. They weren't scientifically figured out like us. Are you in Romans 1? Why? Did I tell you to go there? <laughs> Verse 22. Professing to be wise. These guys are professing to be wise and they have a PhD to prove it. Professing to be wise, they became fools. All who deny God's simplistic word, which is the truth, are fools. When a person rejects the revelation of God that is shown in nature or the natural law, he, she, rejects the very thing that can bring the further revelation that leads to Christ in order to even qualify. Christ himself had to lead a life of suffering to qualify for the cross. He couldn't just get born, oh yeah, I'm the Christ, hang me up. He was tried and tempted and tested. And all of that had to happen. He had to follow the Father's commands in his flesh because he was all man as well as all God. And in his all man part, his humanity, as we say, he had to follow the Lord. He had to trust God the Father. He, Jesus never healed anyone. The Father did. He was the vessel through whom he did it. Mmm. This is one way how Jesus showed us how to live. He didn't just show us how to live because he was a nice guy. He was compassionate, which is what we're all called to be, but not sillier than a fruitcake. And play that love is something that it isn't, or hate is something that it isn't, or justice is something that it isn't, which is what the world does. And the false church. And there's a whole bunch of those. This natural law can be categorized as an eternal law of God. This one that everyone has in their conscience. This law that everyone knows. This law that these people who didn't have a written law followed because it was in their conscience. It's an eternal law of God because the moral principles of the Mosaic law in other words, the Ten Commandments did not begin with a covenant made at Sinai. Rather, they are eternal and immutable, unchanging, as is the holy character of God himself. Hallelujah. This is what Cornelius had. He wasn't a fool. He understood. He said, yes, an angel came. Why did the angel come to Cornelius and not his neighbor? Because Cornelius was already on the way to being saved. He just didn't have enough. He didn't know it was Christ Jesus. Go back to Acts. <coughs> the book of the Acts. Go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, book of Acts. Verse 38. Here's the reason. This is what Cornelius and his family and his servants needed to know. He already praised the real God and wanted to know more. He already believed, but he didn't have this one thing. The word you know, you Cornelius know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea. In other words, the message of Christ and the gospel was proclaimed and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. That's how far back he takes it. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Woo! God anointed Jesus of Nazareth 
Cornelius, you guys, you know this, you heard it. There were witnesses. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. See, there would have been no healing if God wasn't with him. And, ye, and we are witnesses of all this, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him up. Well, who's he showing to Cornelius? Jesus, the Savior, which is what the word means anyway. Verse 41, and not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Ultimately, it was over 500 people who saw him. Verse 42, and he commanded us to, te to preach to the people and to testify that it is he, Jesus, who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, Jesus, all the prophets witness that through him, or rather his name, Jesus, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And Peter's still wanting to go on and look what happens. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision believed were astonished. Because again, they were, grew, up, grew up as Jews and said, well, this can't happen to Gentiles. Are you kidding? God's on our side. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. And they heard him speak with tongues. I didn't get that fortunate yet, but I'm hoping to. I have a friend who is right where Cornelius is. I mean right where Cornelius is. He knows God. He believes God. He believes, you know, he's a good man. He does everything. He, he doesn't outwardly sin. He's never been married. Don't have any kids. You know, he just doesn't. Just the way it is. And this person is so close. <laughs> and uh, I had a chance to witness on Saturday... <laughs> again to this person and we had a wonderful discussion about an hour an hour and a half and uh, it's very close <laughs> I want to hear some tongue talking or whatever from him I want to hear him praise the Lord one day he affirms everything that scripture teaches and he affirms it seriously He's not, he's not BSing himself, okay? He's, he's really doing it, but he, he's still lacking that one little thing. Well, that Holy Spirit comes on him. That confirms to himself and ultimately to whoever's around him. If it's me, hallelujah, somebody else, whatever. And when that happens, whenever I see him next, if I'm not there that moment, I'm going to know. There's no doubt in my mind, I'm going to know. Woo, that's what I'm waiting on. I love it. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. All right. <laughs> if I were at a big rally, I'd say, give the Lord a shout. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if I go, ow. <laughs> it is good news. You can know all you want to know. You can know all you can know. You can understand, oh yeah, well, this couldn't have happened like that. And let me tell you something else. I came across a, a site that was giving several pictures, you've seen it before yourself, of, uh, you know, really, 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 really blown up uh, images of things that, that you can't see with the naked eye. Your electron mic or tele or, yeah, microscope and all that kind of thing. And every dust mite had a design that was perfect. Every hump, everything that stood out, the eye, everything, the compound, all that stuff, the compound eyes, and all that, everything had a design that was incredible. Now, they look scary to us if they were our size. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It'd be, ooh, T-Rex has nothing on these guys. <laughs> or any other mite or some other thing that, they're on us because we need them. We can't get, shower them off. They eat dead skin. Apparently we all need more because they, you know, they don't eat enough of it. Because that's where our dust comes from. <laughs> but my point is, you can know all that and how wonderful that is. And there's no doubt in my mind that, did you know that uh, the scales, or rather the uh, wings of a butterfly are scaly? They're not, it's not a smooth sheet, it's scales. If I knew it before, I forgot it. But this was amazing. 
And they shed that as well, and then just grow them back. Wow. My point is that creation is awesome, and we can't even begin to, to think that we know anything about it other than glorify God for it. And because that's a fact, because that's true, where the door for us is open to then receive what it takes to be saved because that very same Savior is also the very same Creator. God created by the Word which became flesh, which we call Jesus. Mm. That's good stuff. Okay, Acts eleven fourteen. He's the he's he's the <coughs> Paul or Peter still talking. Uh, go down to see this guy Cornelius, who will, and because he know he's he's been told that he's going to send for me, and I'm going to tell him words which you and all your household will uh, will be saved. Verse 15, as I began to speak, he's still explaining himself to the fellow Jews, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning, which means at the upper room, at Pentecost. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, now it made sense to Peter. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, that, uh, who was I that I could withstand God? Duh. When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God. See, they didn't, they quit arguing. They didn't sit there and argue and argue and argue and argue and argue. They understood what Peter was saying was true and it was right. And they had no choice but to agree. You see? Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. New thought to them. Brand new. See, we don't understand what a brand new thought that was. When Luther did his thing and uh, uh, Tyndale and all the others in the past coming against Roman, the Roman Catholic Church, we don't understand how big that deal was. These guys were facing to be burned alive at the stake. And you and I, what are we facing? To lose our job, to lose a friendship. You know, nothing really compared to that. Wow. We got to put ourselves in the place of reality here. Preaching God is an awesome and serious thing and is very, very uh, dangerous in many places of the world right now. This is why I pray for the persecuted church. And I'm not praying for those who, 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 who are sick with a headache or the neighbors bullying them or something like that or they're made fun of or even spat on. I'm praying for those <laughs> who get tortured every day while I speak here right now. We sit here listening to this. Somebody is being tortured because they believe in Christ Jesus as their Savior and Lord, and they're not getting off of that. And I'm not talking about one person. I'm talking about thousands all over the world. The underground church in China is growing. Millions of people. But China has billions of people. It's a very, very small, tiny minority. But if they get caught, they lose it all. It'll, it's coming to a theater near you. That's for sure. It's coming here. Look at the blatant... Uh, uh, or I was sent a, uh, uh, a link to go look at this thing that this, this one person did. A, he went to Eilat, which is a city in the very southern part of Israel, at, right at the, the Red Sea. And he was he was he was amazed at the at the uh, somebody had built the tent of meeting like a copy of it. It's a reduced version of it. And uh, and so I wrote him back and said, "Well, yeah, we were there. We actually toured it. We were we actually were there, so he was blown away by that. But uh, on his way to there in the downtown Elad, if you will, which we did that too. And if it was there at the time, we didn't see it. There's a great big tribute." To, to, uh, to, the uh, to, to Freemasonry. I mean, a huge one, like big as this fireplace is tall and, and wide and, and it's got a big G and, the, you know, and the, the, the square and all of that, the compass. I mean, in Eilat, Israel. And I told you before when we were there, which was in 206, of uh, the totem poles I saw. And I asked a local guy, what's that with this pagan stuff? He goes, oh, it's just, it's just art. It's just nothing. You see, willing ignorance 
Israel is in trouble. They're in more trouble right now than even Gentiles, if I can say it that way, because to them were given the prophets, to them were given the word, to them, and from them came the Lord Jesus. And yet they're willingly denying it. Opting for the world. Doing the homo, gay pride, LGBT, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z thing. It's crazy. These people are crazy. They're dumber than stupid, for one, because they deny what Paul says. You can't deny. You are with knowledge of God and that everything you see, he created. You can't get around it. You have no excuse. That's why they're stupid. Well, well, you shouldn't call them stupid. Of course I should. They're stupid. Anyone who denies God is stupid. Why? Because they know him. Go back to Romans. I want to put this in your head like it never been there before. Romans 1. As soon as I find it. Yeah. For since, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attribute, God's attributes that you can't see, all his power, all his knowledge, all his foreknowledge, all his everything, are clearly seen. And they're not just seen, they're being understood. And the being here is not past or, 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 or future, it's right now. And whatever generation gets born on the earth is in the being understanding, you see. If you were born in 1950, you're understanding. If you were born in 1850, you're understanding. If you were born in 50, you're understanding. If you were born before Christ, you're understanding. Because God created everything. And every human being understands it. Right here it is. And all the other phallic symbols in Elot and elsewhere all over the place. And, uh, and he just goes on and on and on and on with a denial of God. I have never seen a more stupid people besides Israel. They're number one. The number two would be the Germans and then the rest of Europe. They have also willingly, ignorantly given up told you before that when the, that silly book that has no, that doesn't even give the answer to its title, The Origin of Species, came out in 1859, became a bestseller in Germany first because they had enough of God. They had it up to here with God. It's like, I don't want God. We want ourselves. And God's punished them ever since. He's punished them now with all this mass immigration. It's tearing them up. They're having riots right now again. And the riots can only get worse because people are tired of it. They're doing the Nazi salute and everything. Not just there. They're doing it in Sweden. They're doing it in Eastern Europe. I, one guy was being interviewed. What a great job Hitler did for everybody and what a good man he was. Now Hitler was a godless twit. Guilty as hell. However, however, he did under his regime... Lots of good changes were made. You know why you work a 40-hour week? Largely because of Hitler. You know why you have uh, cafeterias in your, in, your, in your factories and bathrooms? Because of Hitler. They were done there first. Yeah, a lot of things you don't know. You ever drink a Fanta? That came from there. See, we don't know enough. And we can never know enough. But what we can know, what we do know, because Paul says it by the Holy Spirit, is that God did it all. And Cornelius knew it. And that's what saved him. That's what opened the door for Peter to come. What if Peter would have come to somebody called Cornelius or not, and Cornelius really didn't know that or didn't really believe that or sort of whatever, could have, would have, should have, whatever God's fine with me. Well, he would have never been sent in the first place. But if he had been sent... If you can picture that scenario, and he opens the door, and here's Peter saying, hey, look at this Jesus, da, 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 da. And he says, so what? Would there have been a descent of the Holy Spirit on them? Well, no. See, he was being prepped, just like you were prepped in your life, 
and you're being prepped, and I'm being prepped for prepped for whatever's next. Blah, 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 blah. Whatever's next. I love it. All right, back to Ro- or Acts 11, please. So the Holy Spirit fell. God gave the same gift, a new thought to them. Verse 19, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyrus, and Antioch, preaching the word to the one, or to no one, but to Jews only. See, they still, you know, they, they still couldn't get themselves to, uh, to go to the Gentiles because that was forbidden. That's why this happened. But look what happens. Verse 20, but some of them, but some of them, but some of them, but some of them were men from Cyrus and Cy- Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they her- had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists or the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. And look at this. Guess what? The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Hallelujah. A great number of Greeks or Gentiles. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Why? To confirm. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged him. See, just like he saw the grace of God, he realized these guys really got saved. I'm going to realize it. This acquaintance and friend of mine. When it happens, I'm going to know. I already know he's got all the qualifications. The door's already wide open. All that has to happen is to say, yo, Verse 24, for he that, uh, or, I'm sorry, 23, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and, listen, what did he do? He said, okay, once you're in, you're in. No, no, he said he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. Okay, you got him, but now continue. Because if you get him today and you don't continue till tomorrow, it was a waste. Continue with the Lord. No one saved, always saved here. Possibility of apostasy instead. For he was a good man, this Barnabas. The word Barnabas means to be an encourager. And full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Little anointed ones. And in these days prophets came, these are New Testament prophets, from Jerusalem to Antioch. And these were specially anointed people because look what they did. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So he stood up and he spoke that this was going to happen. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, each according to his ability, each according to his or her ability, Determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. They made a quality decision. No social gospel here like is taught today. The world has actually crept into the church to the extent to where the church feels guilty if they don't help the world. If they don't give to these worldly things. That's never what the Bible teaches. The world's a world. Let them alone. Oh yeah, we're not cruel or anything. If somebody needs help, we help them. But we don't use church funds, as it were, to help the world. It's to help us. Then the disciples, and according to the bill, determined to send relief to the brethren. To who? The brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. You see, there's a, they just didn't say, oh, here it is. Whoever wants it. No, no, it goes to the elders. It goes to the designated people who have the job to do a certain thing or another. There's always order in the church. This is why when we established our little body, we created order and we followed the Holy Spirit, the teachings of Acts and elsewhere on how to do that to the best of our ability. Are we perfect at it? No. Are we lacking somehow? I'm sure. 
But we are doing it. If we had a bunch more people, we'd have a bunch more uh, responsibility to hand out to others who would have to take it because somebody's got to take it. So we're all kind of easy right now because of where we are, but who knows what's going to happen. What, what would happen if, if, a, if suddenly a statute was given from the city council here or the county council or whoever or both that, you know, all churches ought to do one thing or another that we know we can't do as Christians. I think the real Christians would play harder or not play harder, work harder to seek membership that they can join, to seek other like-minded people with whom they can unite because united we are strong and that's 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 what we have to rub each other's back we have to pat each other's back on top of the head whatever it takes to say stay in the faith stay in the faith stay in the faith don't quit don't quit just like Barnabas said great you guys are here I testify that you are now stay there continue in the Lord Jesus continue in your belief it's about continuing it's about abiding and that's what we're going to do because you know what we don't really have a choice either the good thing about true Christians is we don't need a choice like that anymore. We already made our choice. It, it's over. It's done. We're, we're, we're here and that's where we're staying. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for telling us about Cornelius who had everything he needed but the very last little thing. He needed to know about Yeshua, the Savior. He knew that Savior as being the true God, as being the creator, but he didn't know him as Savior. He'd heard it because the word was all throughout all Judea, just like Peter told him, you know, you heard it ever since the baptism of John, that Jesus was anointed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're the anointed one, the Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. The Savior anointed of God. And there is nobody like you. There's no wonder, Peter says, there's only one name given unto heaven by which men must be saved. And you're that one, Lord. Forgive us all our sins, I pray. Make us strong in the years and days to come here, whatever we have to face individually, with relationships, with business, with traffic, <laughs> everything we need to face, Lord, help us and carry us through. For when this life is over, what's going to matter is, did we believe you or did we believe the world? Let us stay strong in you by your help. In Jesus' name, amen.